Hello and welcome to Unit 2. In this unit we'll be exploring uh, the creation myths by which the Greeks understood the origins of the universe and the origins of the gods. We'll be looking at a poet named Hesiod whose Theogony is going to be our primary source for exploring these topics. Hesiod himself uh, was a rough contemporary of Homer. They lived around the same time. Uh, we know more about uh, Hesiod's life, and we do know that he was an actual person. Uh, he makes uh, references to his family, uh, to his region, uh, the region of Boeotia where he lived, uh, and he talks a lot about the daily life of somebody trying to uh, make a living as a farmer in ancient Greece and how difficult a life that was. But Hesiod also had a creative side. Uh, his Theogony is going to be uh, the best surviving account that we have today on uh, the origins of the gods. And uh, again, we should note that uh, Hesiod did not make this stuff up. He was shaping and borrowing from the orally transmitted material, but he provides a finished narrative uh, to these various tales uh, of the universe and of the gods and of their origins. Uh, established right away uh, in Hesiod's Theogony uh, is this uh, ideal of the uh, Greek gods uh, being uh, anthropomorphic, uh, meaning that they are human-like. They eat, they drink, sleep, mate, feel emotions, uh, emotions that are both positive and negative. They can be every bit as jealous and, and petty as the worst of human beings, and uh, later Greek commentators will actually reflect on that and wonder what kind of role models the gods are. But nevertheless, uh, they uh, take on human form. Uh, I've chosen the statue of Poseidon to give you some indication of how a Greek would imagine uh, their gods and or goddesses. Uh, certainly the gods are uh, larger in size, they're more beautiful in appearance, and of course the big difference, the big distinction is uh, the gods are immortal, they are the deathless ones, whereas human beings, uh, we suffer from the condition of mortality and that always uh, presents a gulf in understanding between uh, the gods uh, with their immortality and mortals. Now Theogony uses the narrative of the, of the gods birth to describe events that we today would approach through science and philosophy even psychology and this aspect of the Theogony means that a character uh, and a, a divine character can be both a natural force uh, or element uh, and can also be an anthropomorphic entity with you know volition and emotion and bodily functions. Um, the gods do not create the universe, uh, they are a part of it. Now as we move through uh, the red text on this particular slide, we'll first note that Theogony will posit uh, the existence of several primordial entities. Uh, there is Chaos, Gaia, Tartaros and Eros. Uh, chaos in ancient Greek meant a chasm, a, a, an absence of something, a yawning, not a state of disorder as the word implies today. Uh, Hesiod uh, says that chaos came first and then came Gaia. Now it is unclear whether Gaia and the original entities were born from chaos or simply appeared after chaos. Uh, Gaia, or Gi, as uh, this entity is, is known, this uh, female entity is known, is the Earth. And we might think of Mother Earth here. Um, and because Hesiod's universe is geocentric, she is pictured as the first natural entity to exist. Uh, Tartaros is the underworld, the land that will eventually be inhabited uh, by the souls of dead humans. Uh, Eros, uh, meaning sexual desire, is going to be the driving force for procreation. And uh, I, some of you who are familiar with the Greek myths will uh, think of Aphrodite when you think of sexual desire. But in Hesiod's account, uh, it is Eros uh, as a primordial entity that will uh, be the deity most responsible for sexual reproduction. Now, after the appearance of the primordial deities, uh, those four, Chaos, Gaia, Tartaros, and Eros, uh, we will now see um, birth and sexual reproduction uh, become the standard means uh, of reproducing. Now, Gaia will then mate with Uranus and produce 12 children uh, who are called the Titans. 
there's a problem though. Uh, these 12 titans uh, that are conceived and develop within Gaia's womb, uh, Ornos, uh, their father, does not allow the children to be born. He pushes them back into Gaia's womb. And that, of course, causes uh, Gaia some uh, pain, uh, both physical and emotional pain, that her consort, that Uranos, is not allowing these children to be born. So what's going on here? Why is Uranos engaging in such bad behavior, not allowing his own children, the Twelve Titans, to be born? Uh, why is he causing Gaia such pain and consternation? Well, the answer that we that many scholars point to is in the form of again recognizing that these divine beings, these entities, uh, are anthropomorphic, not only physically but also emotionally. Uh, Oranos is uh, clearly uh, behaving like a petty, vindictive dictator who does not want to share. Uh, power. He believes that his children represent a threat to his rule over the cosmos uh, and does not want to deal with the competition, so he refuses to allow the Titans uh, to be born. Now, Gaia, in her turn, uh, as an anthropomorphic entity, uh, is not going to uh, want to take this type of uh, bad behavior. She will uh, conspire with her youngest born, uh, Kronos. Uh, one of the young, the youngest of the Titans, she will conspire with him uh, to do something about this. And uh, it's a gruesome scenario that presents itself to us. Uh, Gaia will craft a sickle made out of a very uh, hard substance, adamant, and will give it to Kronos. And uh, when Uranos next visits Gaia uh, for sexual intercourse, uh, Kronos, who is inside of Gaia's womb, is going to grasp hold of his father's genitals and will sever them using this sickle. The severed genitals then fall into the sea where they will produce uh, the goddess Aphrodite. When uh, the castration occurs, Uranos uh, retreats uh, back to where the sky is and now you have space between earth and sky and the titans can then be born uh, and develop so this constitutes what i'm referring to as generational war number one in which you have uh, chronos uh, conspiring with his mother uh, to overthrow the power of uranos of the older generation and uh, what we'll look at next is Generational War Part 2, when Kronos, uh, now, although the youngest of the Titans, because he acted so boldly uh, in overthrowing the power of his father, Kronos uh, will take charge uh, of the universe. And so now, now the setup is for Generational War Part 2, uh, because uh, the same basic pattern uh, is going to repeat in the next generation when Kronos, uh, in his turn, tries to prevent the birth of his children. Uh, Kronos will marry his sister, his fellow Titan, Rhea, and they will produce six children, Hestia, Demeter, Hera, Hades, Poseidon, and Zeus. Um, unlike his father, unlike Oranos, Kronos does not leave his children in, in uh, the mother's body. And uh, instead, uh, he tries to, he allows them to be born, uh, but he will swallow each child as it is born. And, of course, Rhea reacts much as Gaia did uh, with this uh, abuse of her progeny and decides to do something about it. So when Rhea finds out she is pregnant uh, with a sixth child, uh, the child that will be Zeus, uh, she decides to save this baby from being consumed by Kronos. Uh, Rhea and Gaia conspire together and they work out a plan. Uh, they decide to... Uh, hand Kronos a large rock that is wrapped in a blanket uh, and Kronos will consume that thinking it is a child but the child itself uh, little baby Zeus uh, will be spirited away to Crete uh, will be hidden away in a cave there and will be protected uh, by some minor uh, Cretan divinities called the Cortes and uh, here Zeus will uh, grow to maturity and when he does uh, he will immediately uh, confront uh, Kronos and with the aid of Gaia somehow Kronos is forced to vomit up the five siblings of Zeus uh, Hestia, Hera, Demeter, Hades and Poseidon 
And uh, once joined uh, by his five siblings, uh, we have half uh, of the Olympians, uh, these six gods and uh, six uh, of the children of Zeus, uh, who we'll discuss a little later on, will become together. These 12 gods will become together known as the Olympians. And once free from uh, Kronos' belly, uh, Zeus and his siblings will begin waging a 10-year struggle uh, for supremacy against Kronos uh, and his siblings. So we see Olympians as the younger generation waging a 10-year war against the Titans. And uh, this struggle uh, is going to be known as the Titanomachia. And, uh, of course, Zeus and the Olympians ultimately will be uh, victorious. And uh, it, it is important to note, though, that Zeus doesn't rely exclusively on brute force. He uses diplomacy, he uses negotiation to gather allies. And of course this is a very civilized way of doing things. And it does contrast greatly with the Titans and uh, who are known as savage and primitive and uh, relying on brute force. Zeus brings a very polished veneer uh, to these types of dramas. And uh, through a careful uh, bit of negotiation uh, and persuasion, Zeus is able to enlist the aid of uh, some first generation outcasts, uh, the Cyclopes and the Hecatonchires, the Hundred Handers. And of course it will be the uh, Cyclopes who will uh, forge for Zeus his lightning bolts that will become his uh, trademark weapon and he will wield very effectively against the Titans. But it's important to note that Zeus again has this balance of you know force when necessary but reaching out uh, and using uh, diplomacy uh, to gather friends and uh, bring allies together.